Welcome to a ride on the outside. MMA is full of people on the inside, but what about the ones that watch from beyond? Welcome to the MMA Outsiders with Tom Albano and Zan Bando on the Empty the Bench Podcast Network. Well, Zan, that was one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time. Oh, no doubt about it. Um, it's good to be back for episode 80 of the MMA Outsiders and what is more so going to be a post-modern um, mo- uh, to UFC 300 that was, without a doubt, one of the best pay-per-views of all time, if not the greatest UFC pay-per-view of all time, and just one of the those events that you'll never forget where you were when you saw it, and uh, you were definitely exhausted uh, from it, or at least I was after uh, after seeing it. So we have we have had to talk about we have other major UFC fun news to talk about, including uh, the biggest star in the sport uh, uh, coming back and so much more. But be, but before we get to all of that, be sure to like and subscribe uh, to the Empty the Bench podcast as network on YouTube as we have passed the seven hundred subscriber marks. So we are slowly and early um churning up more and more subscribers by the day and by the week so we thank you guys for that be sure to hit the notification bell so you get notified of everything at the empty the bench podcast network including every single episode of the mma outsiders and all of the other great show those that are taking place on the network and so much more of this show is sponsored by playback which um it's obviously our new sponsor where we get to watch live games with everybody synced up and so much more can you kind of tell our viewers for those who may not be familiar with what playback is, playback is what it's all about, and what um uh, other fans of the network should expect um in the coming weeks and months with all of the different sports content that we have coming out and so much more. Yep. So of course the uh, the MMA Outsiders, along with the rest of the Empty Bench Network, is presented by Playback. Watching sports is more fun with others, but we spend too much of our time watching alone. Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage, deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary, and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive in a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB network Find out more, including our live stream schedule. And that's not all. The NBA playoffs are here. Starting tonight, which is the day that we're first releasing this episode, April 16th. Tonight, starting tonight, we bring you live coverage of the NBA play-in tournament with the Western Conference. As LeBron James and the Lakers go on the road to face Brandon Ingram and the Pelicans. Followed by Steph Curry and the Warriors going on the road to face De'Aaron Fox and the Kings. Coverage starts tonight at 7.15 p.m. Eastern. Tomorrow, we bring you live coverage of the Eastern Conference as Jimmy Butler and the Heat go to the city of brotherly love to take on Joel Embiid and the 76ers. Followed by Trey Young and the Hawks going to Chi-Town to take on DeMar DeRozan and Zen, your Chicago Bulls. Cover starts That's tomorrow. Exactly right. Cover starts tomorrow at 6:45 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, so the NBA uh, post season is here, so we're going to do our best to bring you wall to wall coverage from the first day of the NBA play in tournament into hopefully, um, assuming that whoever is in the NBA finals and it ends up being a good series, hopefully it's with thrilling games, extra game seven in early June. So stay tuned with um uh, with all. The, as for all of the playback madness and so much more, we're going to be bringing you as much content as we can, including some look backs ahead of the end of the draft and ahead of a very important fight that we're going to be talking about later on in the show. And so much more. But before we get into all of the all of the happenings of the show, Tom, would you like to remind everyone where um, or every single person in the world can find our ugly mugs in terms of work? Okay, so. On my right, as always, Sam Bando, staff writer of BJPen.com and MMA Knockout. Uh, I'm Tom Albano, contributor to MMA News, fan-sided MMA, and updater 
our writer for the uh, PFL website. Zan, yourself, and Brett Cagle, uh, our own from Brett's Bets, will be live in Chicago this Friday night for the PFL Chicago card. And man, we cannot wait. Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. It'll be my first event under the MMA Knockout umbrella, so I'm excited to uh, represent us and our great team over there and uh, expect to see a lot of content uh, starting um, of me starting tomorrow with virtual media day and continuing uh, Thursday for the weigh-ins and obviously Friday for the fights as the fights get underway, I believe, just a little bit after 6 p.m. local time, so it should be a lot of fun and it'll be nice to get... Uh, but back out on the road and get some in-person coverage in as I enjoy going to every single event, regardless of promotion and stakes. And it'll be nice to say that I took a small part in already a hellacious PFL 2024 regular season, which seems to be getting better and better by the week, doesn't it? I know. I remember last, I remember last year after the first stage, there were a little complaints about, you know, how the cards were going. And now at this point, the cards have been actually pretty damn good. And I can't wait to see what this third, the final part of the first stage of the regular season brings us. But we obviously have to get to the major story of this week, which of course is going over all of the UFC madness that was this past week. And before we get into what UFC 300 was, we have to get to the big elephant in the room because even though it is called UFC 303, I guess you could say UFC 300 and a half is finally done. The that everybody has been wanting to wanting to see for over a year is done. Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler. Mark, mark it on your calendars. UFC 303, June 29th, culminating with UFC International Fight Week at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. Tom, we have a deal. It's official. Can you believe it? At uh, last. It's finally happened. It only it took you so long. But you finally did it. <laughs> Hold on. You finally made it happen. Oh my god. <laughs> and and this comes also about a week or so after, or, or is it a day or so after? A day Dana, or so after. After uh, Dana at the Power Slap press conference, like, oh no, that's all internet BS. Yeah, well, um, I it's the internet. And the internet BS part was partially true because the question was more so about a video package potentially being played ahead of this announcement. When, when, when what it when what it really was was Dana for the first time apparently being handed in a piece of paper which had a bunch of announcements and of course this ended up being the one and then of course all the assembled media that were there went <laughs> went crazy and rightfully so. And, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, really, you're gonna save it though for the press conference. Wouldn't it have been more fun if at the end of the pay per view? So, you know how John Janik does all the sign offs and everything, and they do yeah, the yeah. outro, and then all of a sudden the outro goes static or something, and then you hear, and then you hear uh, the start to the Foggy Dew with Sinead O'Connor, and you hear McGregor's voice surprise, surprise, the king is back, and that they end the pay per view with the graphic or something. That would have been, that would have been the greatest outro in the history of pay-per-view outros if you've ever seen one and but only but but only in an alternate universe did that wouldn't take place um, from an unfortunate perspective but the fortunate thing is conor mcgregor versus michael chandler has done five rounds 170 pounds the main event of ufc 303 again and june 29th as people alluded to um i'm just going to say this as someone who has been to Las Vegas to a Conor to a Conor McGregor fight in the past. I thought the McGregor Poirier three fight week was crazy. This is going to be on another level. You're going to get people in Las Vegas that weekend that don't even know what MMA is, but but know who Conor McGregor is. You're, you're going to get people very very similar to myself, or the diehard junkies. You're going to get some celebrities that maybe only watch all the major sporting events and they consider the it's one of them. Las Vegas is going to be the place to be, whether you're the, or the party or whether you're the, or to see Conor McGregor or Michael G. I'm going to win. It is going to be a at was June 29th in Vegas. So if you are even remote, he considering going to Las Vegas for this weekend. That's when you can get on all your travel and the better because that is going to be arguably one of the hottest tickets of the entire summer in sports. And I cannot wait to see. 
see this fight and how it plays out. That's for sure. I'm very, I'm very excited for it. I, I cannot believe, you know, is some of my motivation for this fight gone a little bit considering how long it took? I mean, I, I love the, I loved what you said a couple of weeks ago that technically tough 31 is not over and it's not going to end until we're in the middle of tough 32. Uh, yeah, unfortunately. And I guess you could say that not only is it UFC 303, it is the real oh, ultimate fighter 31 finale. If you want to, if you want to call it, if you want to call it that. So the coach fight. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, some of my motivation is gone, but you are right in that the place is going to be an absolute madhouse when you consider Conor McGregor is just coming off of the press tour for the film Roadhouse that he was right. in. <laughs> the fact that this is his first fight since the trilogy fight that he lost and broke his leg in. So there's a lot of anticipation that's going to be not, not only that, this is on the heels of UFC X, which is a very big annual celebration for the sport of MMA. So there's going to be more going on than just this fight itself, which makes it even a, even a more, even more of a banner weekend, if you will. For sure. Uh, and as far as this fight goes, I guess the question at this point is how Conor McGregor is going to look. Now, the good news on that front for him is that this fight's going to take place at 170 pounds. Now, this is against what he had originally told us told everybody on New Year's Eve he wanted which this was, fight at which middle was 185 yeah yeah but but I think you know people want to see Conor McGregor competing at a weight division like a fly, at a featherweight or a lightweight or a welterweight and I think Conor McGregor at you know a little heavier of a weight class might be something a little different I mean we have seen Conor McGregor at welterweight before the Nate Diaz fight the Donald Cowboy Cerrone fight, but I feel like the fight with Chandler is going to be I mean, it's going to be something else to see. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people that feel the same way as you, that they literally don't know how the fight is going to go. It's there for the spectacle aspect of it, which speaking to spectacle... Yeah, 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 it, that, I have a feeling I know what the fight's going to go, but I that's the part I was going to do. That this is going to be a spectacle because it's been so long that we have that we've seen Conor McGregor. We're getting to the point now where it's going to basically be three years since that last fight. So right. we're getting we're entering we're entering you know John Jones absence territory near George St Pierre absence territory. So people's desires. I don't know how people's desires to see Conor McGregor fight are, but as you said. You're going to see the whole world, the whole fighting world descend upon Las Vegas, especially with a big week, big week like the International Fight Week. Oh, for sure, which I guess leads to my next question. Bob, is this an appropriate fight to bring back a press tour, or do you think the UFC is not going to do that? Because I feel like with 74 days to go before before this fight, you have to strike with iron top. And I, it was just as curious as to what your perspective is um it that you know there's a little over two months to go and there doesn't there doesn't seem to be a full promotional plan yet for how uh for how this fight is going to be built because the UFC probably thinks that the fight already sells itself. I think yeah, I think the fight kind of sells itself. So I don't think they're going to go with a press tour. I think they're just going to do the big press conference during International Fight Week itself. Um and. My question is, you know, McGregor Chandler, I just talked about, I talked with Pat last week, I talked with you and Brett over the weekend, that there was no other alternate alternative. When you consider Drickus and Israel might be doing it, might be doing business for the middleweight title 305 in August, considering the circumstances of the John Jones situation we talked a couple of weeks ago, considering plans for, say, Manchester and Newark and everything. There was no real choice, but McGregor Chandler had to headline this card. Right. My question also is, I, what kind of undercard do you think they're going to build around this? I don't, I know, don't know. Because, because we're going to get to in just a second, when we slowly and surely just re-dissect UFC 300, it's going to determine 
whether or not some of the, those guys from UFC 300 are healthy. And if not, you might have to start moving some fights around from other cards to make new fights for 303. Because I feel like with how many people are booked up right now, you might have to do some shuffling that maybe you weren't expecting to do before the 303 main event was announced. Or they, it could have fights in the works that nobody else knows about. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of options, but that, that co-main event specifically is going to be very, very interesting. I don't know why my mic muted itself there. Um, oh, good. I can hear you now. Yeah. No, I don't know why my mic muted itself. Um, But the co-main event, I mean, I don't know, Zan, if this is the kind of card that... I, I mean, McGregor, they never really do a title fight under, no, no. McGre under a McGregor main event. They've done it twice. I mean, they did it once in 2016 for the first Nate fight. Then they did a title a title eliminator with Rumble Johnson, I think Lover to share it for the second. Uh, they even they even done it for his last four pay per views. A, yeah, a title so fight think, underneath him. So I think McGregor Chandler bear basically going to say is going to sell itself, and it probably will. I it mean both will. Dust, both Dustin pay per views in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, still got over a million bucks. Yeah, the one the one I went to, which was the third fight, did 1.9 million. So. Um, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, McGregor star I mean, power. I mean, that one, I mean, that one so old itself, and that one had a weak undercard in itself. The only other fight people were excited about were Gilbert Burns and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, and that fight was super underwhelming. So, yeah. So, I mean, they're going to go with the feeling that the fight's going to sell itself, and McGregor still has the star power. Will that hold up after all this absence? Who I know. I, 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 I think, I think so, oh, too. I think people have been eager to see him fight. I think he's been frustrated in, in the media for over a year that he hasn't gotten a fight. And now that he now that he has a fight, it probably feels like a revenge tour frustration uh, business trip where he's going to try to pull off the biggest FU performance of all time. And there are thousands of people or potentially millions of people that want to see him get his ass kicked. And, the, and there's the other side that wants to see him achieve his so-called greatest comeback in sports history, which I I am. Uh, and as you don't believe for a second, I obviously know that his injury is very gruesome. But to me, him being out for three years is different than you know, or maybe being out for a year and coming back. So I, I, I don't, I don't really know. All I know is that um, I have a own, own, I have a own done that, that I can hear every single day that tells me hey, how many days we are to this fight, and I think it's going to be the slowest um, on on two June twenty ninth and. Ate some time, and I think that we're going to be arguing about um, who to pick in this fight back and forth for the next five, six weeks, and I can't, I can't wait. So, yeah, especially because uh, little birdie told me I think we're on two very opposite ends of the spectrum for that one. That is true. I think we, I, I think we are. Yeah, that should be fun. Uh, but three oh three, you know, as they say, Zan, on some of those old school commercials. But wait, there's more. It's we true. have to get to 302 first before we get to 303. In your I, backyard, by the way. Uh, I don't know if I can consider New Jersey my backyard, but <laughs> it's close enough. Close enough. Shout out, uh, you know, shout out Ryder for uh, Ryder University for that. Uh, Islam Makashev, Dustin Poirier, they have confirmed it. Lightweight title is on the line. Co main event. Here's the WTF one I wasn't expecting. Sean Strickland. Paulo Costa, five rounds. Yeah, that one doesn't make sense considering that Paulo Costa is coming off of a, of, of a loss, obviously. And of course, Sean Strickland just came off, off of losing his middleweight title to drink his two plus. He is it a fun fight in terms of name value? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it a fight that makes sense ranking wise? Absolutely no. not. No, <laughs> no, no way. If this isn't an easy one. I'm just gonna say this: if this is if this isn't an easy layup for and Strickland, and this fight is even remote and competitive, I might literally you start laughing my ass off because it should it should be. I mean, Dan, I hate to say this because I don't want to diss Sean Strickland, but you know my feelings about Paulo Costa, and even though he had a hell of a performance against Robert Whitaker, it was still a one sided fight. Oh, for and sure. And we've talked about the names which Sean Strickland has beaten. 
it had he doesn't have a, the greatest of resumes outside of the historical upset of Israel Adesanya. So no, an, and and he hasn't fought the same names the pa the Paulo Costas fought either. Right. So, so so uh very similar to the Philadelphia Eagles uh from Football Friday this past season. If Strickland loses his fight, we may have to put him on fraud alert. <laughs> I would do the whole thing here, but at this point we can't do that to Sean Strickland just yet. So but guarantee you, if Sean Strickland loses to Paulo Costa, you know how we had the alert sound and we had the fraud alert ban? I'm making one for Sean Strickland if that happens. All right. Well, given you were the biggest DDP fan, I know you were going to, if that happens, you were, you were going to have an absolute blast making that. That's for that's for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, but, just, are yeah. you, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this based on all of Islam Makachev's fights. This is the one fight where I think he could potentially struggle the most given the, that I yeah. interviewed Dustin Portier, given the that he beat Benil, um, uh, Benil Ben Saint Denis in Miami back at UFC 299. He will give Islam everything in the kitchen sink, and that is going to be one of one of the one of the best fights the entire year by far. <laughs> that's what I that, that's what I think it is going to be a, a lightweight title fight that people replay over and over and over again. Or with some good wins, but I will say this: if this fight stays standing and Portier cracks him, it could get very, very, very interesting. That's and that's the that's thing. I'm not sure. And that's the thing. I'm not sure if this fight stands uh, stays standing, especially Zan. I mean, do you think Dustin tries to jump the gilly? No, absolutely not. <laughs> even though, even though he told the fan on Twitter that if he that if he doesn't want to see Dustin Portier jump guillotines, to not to not I buy tickets to go to to go to the fight. So we'll see. <laughs> also, also bear in mind he jumped the gilly on um. Islam's uh, Islam's mentor, uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov, in their title fight like five years ago, and he as, nearly got it as in. Did, as did in his fight against Charles Oliveira too. <laughs> that that's true too, and and uh, especially with the Khabib one, he nearly sunk it in. I got scared for a second watching it that that was going to happen. I know. Could you as far to say that Portier could get or Nicky choke for the third time in a lightweight title fight, or are you not going to... Unfortunately, yes, I think it could happen. No way. Uh, <laughs> well, here's here's the other part that I wanted to talk about with you, uh, Zan. Okay. So, I don't know if you saw, but Armin Saruki, and he got the win over Charles Oliver. I, 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 I did. I think I know. I think I know where you're going. But do you believe <laughs> that? Do you believe that Sarukian was offered the fight on short notice and basically said no? I do. Yeah, I do believe that. It, 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 do you blame Sarukian for saying no, no or do you no. feel like that's a missed opportunity? No, of course. First, I don't blame Sarukian for saying no because he probably didn't think he could make the quick turnaround and make the weight fast enough. I think I, I think it's fair, and he and, and he knows that given his age and given the guy is that that he's fought. It's not it's not like he's not going to get an opportunity. It's not like he had fought for the title, lost, and is going to get an opportunity again. And this was his this was his first opportunity. So, so I would, say, I would say in the in this in this rare case, he was fine not to accept the title fight. So and it would have made the people even considering. And tickets more are disappointed because you only have one one guy who draws star power, not two. In this case, in this case, you have two. So right. I, I mean, at the very least, Dustin has more star power than Armin, even though Armin is going to probably be ranked number one by the time this show airs tomorrow. Here's my question, right. though. Uh, but I, I say here's my question, though. Like I didn't just ask a question already. But okay. Um, okay. So you're so you're Armin then. Does this then mean, given everything that happened at 300, if okay. Islam if Islam wins this fight, is that the Abu Dhabi main event for 308? Islam versus Armin seems seems like a relatively easy way up to me. Yeah, yeah, of uh, course, of course. But what now, do you, what do you what do you think? I agree, although there is a risk because if Dustin wins this fight, <laughs> then they have to go immediate rematch. That would mean. Dustin versus Islam as a co-main in Madison Square Garden in November. That's what I. That's what I. That's what I think. Oh, so if if Dustin pulls off the upset and they fight at the Garden, who do you see headlining three hundred eight? 
Or, Jones. or wait, Jones. you think Jones versus Stipe is going to main event in Abu Dhabi? No, Jones versus Stipe in Madison Square Garden is okay. the main event. You scared me for a second. No, no. <laughs> no. No, there's no, no way my, you know, my, no, they would do that if I Abu Dhabi. No. My question wasn't MSG, man. My question was Abu Dhabi. <laughs> oh, uh, well, yeah, then Abu Dhabi, they might be stuck in a conundrum. But what you might end up having to do they is would, they the would have to. Um, it would no, have have be to. the winner of Hamza Whitaker versus, uh, versus DDP then. That's what you. That, well, that's well, what, I, well, I was going to say they would have to pray that Hamza wins, but then you have a problem. Because Drickus versus Israel is supposed to headline 305 in August. Well, well, and well, then that's when you uh, that's when you try to well, even though even though the UFC would would be dumb for doing this, they well, would try to say, that's when you crap on the UFC for their scheduling. Yep, yep, exactly. Which would mean they would try to drag Volk back out, and it would not be it would not be good. It wouldn't be oh, it wouldn't be good. No. I would don't be, want to see Volk in there for some time. That would be a total. That would be a total last resort, but that's like that's like third or fourth at the list, not one or not one or two. So, yeah, no. All right. So one other thing before we get into the three hundred card itself, Anderson Silva, Chael Sonnen from UFC one seventeen, one of the greatest comeback finishes in the history of MMA. It will take its place in the fight wing of the USC Hall of Fame as part of the twenty twenty four class. The bad guy is in the hall. Yeah, the bad guy is finally in the Hall of Fame, and this is without a doubt the best fight from 2010 by far. If you've not seen this comeback, go on YouTube and check it out. It's one of the most unbelievably heroic things you'll ever see. Anders and Silva getting absolutely dominated for 23 of 25 minutes, pulls out a triangle choke from the from the Bolivian, and literally pulls it out to Mitch Chael Sonnen and keeps his long-reigning winning streak at the time going, and it was just a class. Do you remember where you were for it? I think I was here at my house for it. Yeah, I was definitely physically at my house for it, too, and I had, I think, 30 people over, and they could they could not I believe that Anderson Silva actually won. What was funny was half of the people that I ain't over fell asleep after the fourth round, and, and everybody, and then everybody, but he woke up and realized that Anderson Silva was about to win, and then he won. So it was, it was, it was, it was crazy. It's, it's one of those cases, and you know that old the thing that they do on uh, UFC Five Fest and UFC YouTube channel, the thrill and the agony. That's that's oh, what this fight was: the thrill and the sure. agony, for sure. Um, Mike, obviously, for those of you that had know that he fought a couple years later, UFC One Forty Eight, Chael Sonnen was unable to exact revenge, so the rivalry. Ended with Anderson Silva um holding a two nothing lead, but at least this fight it's it's day in the hall and uh, there's definitely there's definitely going to be a funny interaction on stage in Anderson Silva and Chael Son and act like their best friends. So that'll be that'll be that'll be fun. Do you, they were only focusing on Chael. Now Anderson Silva, I guess, wasn't there for three hundred, but they were so focusing on Chael. Do you think Chael is going to be the only one at the Hall of Fame who accepts the award? No, I think uh, I. Th- I think Anderson has to be there because they'll want to set up um potentially whether or not if Anderson Silva is and eventually um and HL Sun and over over for that barbecue that's 13 years too late, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> for a second, Zan, I thought you were gonna say, well, they're testing out the waters for a trilogy fight. No, like, oh. no, 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 no. <laughs> no way. No uh, way. And I don't know how much I can handle. I mean, come on. We watched we watched um Ken Shamrock versus Hoist Gacy in 2016 Bellator. I don't think I want to see something like that again. Right. Yeah, uh, I was on the, I was just saying that they were gonna probably potentially rehash the old barbecue and if it will if it will ever happen again. They'll probably throw some funny insults at each other, but assuming that Anderson Silva shows up, it should be a wonderful, um a wonderful Porsche into the at ceremony and on, on when twenty seventh, when we when they you know, when, when when they walk the stage at the MGM Grand, that's for that's for sure. I now I love it, you love it, but this actually got some flack from hardcore MMA Twitter because really? they said because they said if Chael had won the fight, he tested positive afterwards, so the fight would have just been a no contest. Yeah, and, that, right. and Chael's history with you know failing drug tests and such. So everyone's a little confused about 
this fight making it. But my my counter to that is as you kind of as we kind of said, it's one of the greatest finishes in UFC history. It's a really pivotal part of UFC history. And Chael Sonnen brought some fire here. You know, Chael Sonnen was a predecessor to Con McGregor in terms of, you know, talking the talk and all the trash talk at the UFC press conferences. He wasn't the original, but he was a predecessor. So I feel like you have to have something like this. I mean, well, I he's, one of the greatest, he's one of the greatest MMA fighters to never win a championship at the at the big stage level. Well, uh, there's there's parts of your statement that I agree with, but there's one part of it that I don't. I do not think he. I I do not think he was one of the greatest fighters to never win a title. But I do think he was um, an ambassador in a lot of different ways. He was someone who you know showed like, okay, um, this is how you use your mouth to get what you want. And he ended up getting big fights, obviously with Anderson Silva and with John Jones, and several fights after that. But I think what 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 makes this fight Hall of Fame worthy is the fact that the build-up to this fight was hilarious. It was literally Chael Sonnen just berating him for, for months and months and months, and Anderson Silva just kind of sitting back and saying, what, what, is it, what, 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 is it, what does this guy have on me? And then, you, and then you watch the fight, and you see that Sonnen was literally backing up every single thing he said, obviously, mm-hmm. until the final two minutes around five. So I think there's more than just the fight and it in the Hall of Fame, it was it was it was the entire story of fight one that, that I think the UFC was fascinated by to the point where they're like, we cannot uh, uh, not let this fight have its day in the Hall of Fame. And now it's here, and I think it genuinely deserves it. But I could also understand the other side in saying that this fight doesn't deserve it for the reasons we just mentioned. But I think that the reasons that it that it did get in the Hall of Fame outweigh is the ones that it doesn't, and I think it'll be a very interesting ceremony for sure. Absolutely. I can't wait for it. All right. So we're not going to go over everything UFC 300. We did a post-show on Sunday morning, hours after the card ended. We so sure did. That was here on YouTube. That's here on our social media channels, on Facebook and Twitter. Go check that out over there. And that's where we're going to do – that's where we did a full – uh, card breakdown of each and every single fight that happened. We spent about an hour doing so. So we're here. We're just gonna nab on some of the highlights. The biggest, of course. I mean, Zan, one of the greatest knockouts that we have ever seen. One of the greatest fights that we have ever seen. I am scared, Zan. I told you on the on the post show stream. This is knockout of the year candidate. This is a fight of the year candidate. And I am worried to see if anything is going to top it. And if that does, and, and Sam, I mean, just the simple fact that he got the two of the biggest bonus, the two big bonuses, and the fact that he got a knockout of the year nominee and a fight of the year nominee in one go, especially after you didn't, but a couple of us did start to write him off and wonder, you know, hey, he looked bad at lightweight last time, so I don't know if going against Gaethje is a good chance for him. And Max Holloway does this. This absolutely... I mean, he was already a star. Now this is next level star-making performance. And I mean... I mean, Sand, he's already one fight in. One, one fight into his 2024 campaign. He's already a fighter of the year candidate. I mean, I think you just summed it up perfectly. There's not much more to be said other than the fact that uh, I was a genius and I called it from the start and I said that Holloway, he was going to come out and look the best he's ever looked. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I was so close because, as you know, I got a couple of perfects on Saturday. I was literally, you were one second away from being perfect. I was, and then, <laughs> I was one second away from getting my fifth perfect on the card and I don't know if Holloway pulls out one of the one of the wildest fifth round finishes you've ever seen. Right up there with right up there with the with the with the R Rodriguez spinning elbow from a couple of years ago, which was just absolutely masterful. But um, yeah. only still, only the third Zan only the third time in UFC history a fight ends with a finish at the four fifty nine mark of the fifth round. It was this fight, Yair Rodriguez versus Korean Zombie, 
and one of Demetrius Johnson's flyweight title fights. Oh, oh, um, it was probably the Demetrius Johnson last second armbar. Um, yes, I just don't remember who was against him or the pack quickly. He tell us. Oh, he said it was uh, Kyoji Horiguchi. Oh yeah, it was Kyoji. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. Still, an an absolute, an absolute master class, an absolute classic by Holloway in a fight that he was clearly winning. Whether you had it five zero or, or four one, he was clearly up. But Tom, what about the judge that had it two two go, going in, go, going into the fifth round? Could you could you believe that one? I couldn't. Hold on. Stay off the weed. Tom, we've seen some pretty bad 2-2 scorecards. Where does that one where does that one rank in your opinion? Awful. I had a three, I had a three, I had a three one going into the fifth for Holloway. I, I had the same, I had the same card. I, I think I think the only round I gave Gaethje was I know the commentary they were saying the fourth. I think it was the fourth. Yeah, I think so. Would have either been round four or round three, but round four start, seems a little bit better because the volume of Gagey strikes started to pick up. But uh, yeah. but yeah. But 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 by that point already he needed a finish and he didn't it and he didn't get it. Right. I mean he how, how right. would how would this have been, Zan? If Justin was the one who knocked out Max at the end. Oh, Tom, people would have been flipping in chairs. People would have been in breaking TVs. It would have been, it would have been an absolute mess. It would have been, it would have been, it would have been easy. The, the, the entire team of arena roof might have, might have exploded. <laughs> it, it would have been one of the greatest comeback finishes in history, just like Anderson Silva, Chael Sonnen was. Do you think people would have attempted to storm the cage or no? <laughs> I, I would hope not. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. Yeah, thankfully, thankfully it would have up in my boxing. Nonetheless, one of the craziest last 10 seconds for, as you've ever seen. I mean, that was just absolute that was just absolute savagery. I mean, you mean to tell me Max Holloway in the ring of fire points to the center of the points to the center of the canvas. Wait, he doesn't <laughs> have to do because he's about to win the fight. Right, <laughs> hey, he's like, let's go, let's do it. Like plug. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I think he said it best when he said that the UFC finally had its Arturo Gatti moment, which I would respectfully agree with for sure. Uh, um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, Zan, let's go from one of the greatest knockouts of all time to the knockout that I think is one of the funniest of oh, all for time. Sure. Oh, for Alex sure. Alex Pereira retaining against Jamal Hill. The, one of the greatest fight ending sequences I have ever seen. Cup check. Irv Dean goes to step in. Pereira says, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, hey, the way you were the one that broke the news to me that Pereira had won because uh, given, that fell I, asleep. I, given, the, <laughs> given that I wasn't feeling well Saturday night, I fell asleep in the middle of their walkout. So I you, weren't feel, you, you weren't feeling well. I shouldn't laugh, but I, but you were just telling the story. Of how people were asleep in your house when Anderson Silva Chael Sonnen was happening. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So first, I woke up at five a.m. my time, and sure enough, the first thing I see is a video of a cup check and then a knockout by Pereira. I'm like, what in the world happened? That's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. And Jamal Hill was done. You could tell in the slow motion. <laughs> you see the eyes rolling to the back of his head. <laughs> Oh jeez, yeah. There's a. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying not to laugh, but there's a video on Instagram right now of a zoomed in version that is 2.8 million views, and you can clearly see his eyes rolling to the back of his head. It was so scary. It, it was bad, <laughs> but I mean, it's a dominant win for Alex. Per uh, the fight oh, for wasn't. Sure. The, the fight wasn't doing much up until that point, so oh, it's a sure. dominant win for Pereira. I Absolutely. mean, he lived up to. He lived up to his word. He did say the day after this fight announced that he was going to run through Jamal Hill pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of those things that you should do. You need, need to prove that you're the best light heavyweight in the world. I mean, that's the reason why Pereira came back from his injury was to literally see whether or not he he would he would try to go out and see if Jamal Hill was really the real champion. He put a stop to all of that and so much more, which gives Pereira a ton of options. It's it's I it's, mean it's all un right. it's unreal. So obviously he suffers the injury 
to right. his foot um, after the fight. Now, he in that video that I was referencing, he says right. his plan was to do something like this and then go to 301 in Brazil on headline anyway. So I, I, I don't do, see anything with yeah, that is that doesn't seem logical. And the card for the 301 has already been built. So to move the Pantoja Urzeg fight off the card on with literally a month's notice or less than a month's notice would not be fair to either of those guys. So no, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I mean I understand because the thing is, you know, I kind of understand that the UFC would not want flyweights because they just they don't do flyweight man events, but like I've talked about before, give they Pantoja don't, the option. They don't, but then, but then again, no one knows the buy rates, so why does it even matter? Who the, and, the, yeah, when you, when, thank when, you. When you don't even know what the buy rate is. Thank you. And considering how much they were hyping Pantoja, give him the opportunity to be a headliner in his home country. And who knows? If Pantoja performs well, that's, that's some other potential big fights that they could do back in Brazil with him headlining again. If he if he if he if he if he performs well and and obviously of course if Steve Ursic and it sets up a as a rematch and you could do that fight anywhere so any anyway, back to your original question no I do not see Pantoja or excuse me I do not see Pereira have lighting UFC three he won in Rio I think you I think you shelf him until I don't know maybe maybe sometime in August or September or something like that I just I don't him making a quick turnaround considering that the toe injury is still a factor. So, and yeah. it also doesn't make sense just as Dana alluded to at the press conference for him to move up to heavyweight when he clearly has other guys that he should be fighting. Oh, yeah. the, fact that he, the fact that he called out Tom Aspinall. I mean, I mean, he wants to fight at heavyweight and we assume it was Tom Aspinall for an interim title fight. I mean, they're not going to disrupt the plans for that Manchester. They they, they won't, but it, it, def, it definitely is a crazy dream fight that you could definitely see down the road that I think would do insane numbers for sure. If it if it ever if it ever oh, did sure. happen. For sure. But that but let Tom let's build Tom Aspinall first. Let's do Ooh. let's do the fight with Gone in Europe. Then let's have him take on Jones and or the Jones Stepe winner. And if the Jones Stepe winner bows out. I then mean, the Pereira fight makes sense. Then, then right? Pereira, right, then the Pereira fight makes sense when Tom Aspinall is the full undisputed heavyweight champion at that point. Right, assuming that the, the title of, of him being the full undisputed champion would just carry over if that were if that were to happen. Exactly. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on it. Plus, if, going back to the Manchester thing, uh, now that Islam versus... Uh, Versus Gaethje and Strickland Costa are your two main events for the 302 card in Newark. You know, your options at that point for Manchester are number Leon one. Bilal. Right. It's Aspinall versus somebody like Gunn or Leon Bilal. So at, at that at that point, those are those are the only two fights you can make. I, I just I just think the I think I think Aspinall have lining in, in Manchester if the UFC has it their way makes them probably the most sense. Yeah. When do you think they're going to do Leon versus Bilal? Um, they would either have to do it on that card, or they would have to do it as a as a co as a potential co mate or main event to the Abu Dhabi card. Well, now since we're playing our little armchair matchmaking and men scheduling, okay. we did notice we did notice three hundred six is the Spear, three hundred eight Abu Dhabi, which means they're gonna do two pay per views probably in October. So, probably. And it, yeah. it ended up being, as you alluded to, off the air. And my, it ended up very well being a back-to-back -back sort of thing with 307 and 308. Or, or when, and, we're at, when we're it's 307 and then three weeks later, it's 308. Right. And potentially that might be the Salt Lake City card that you alluded to off the air as well. Yep. So maybe yeah. maybe as that. Because as I told you, quote, unquote, they were, they're, they're, still, they're, still, they're still screwing with the oh. little bit. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know what they're doing. So, so maybe. So maybe that ends up serving as the next Pereira fight was what you were alluding to. That's that could very well be the case for sure, which would mean that they would have to well the kill or undercard only because if you just sell Pereira, it may not do as well as the UFC is probably expecting. So fair enough. 
All right. Uh, other title fight on this card. Weili Zhang retaining the women's strawweight title against Yang Zhanan. People kind of crapped on this one a little bit, but I mean, it's hard to it's hard to follow Gallo, Holloway and Gaethje. I think some of us saw that that was going to be hard to do. I'm just going to say that Weili is one of the best strawweight fighters of all time. She, she's slowly but surely making her way to the claim as the greatest UFC women's strawweight ever. She's very close to it. Um, this was a dominant performance for her. Nearly got the finish in the first round. Um, looked good for the rest of it. It just fought incredibly well. And to me, the the next logical step for her, which I, which I think would be insane, and I'm sure you're going for some. I think I know where you're going with this. I think I know where you're going with it. All right, I'm just gonna say it. I think you. I think you co-headliner at the Spear on September 14. What about what about you? Oh. Okay, then what I'm going to say, what I thought you were going to say, was it would be the next logical step then, if she were to win at the Sphere, that she moves up to flyweight and challenges the Grasso Shevchenko three winner. Which is the fight that should happen, which is the fight that Dana wants to see, and I'm sure all the hardcore women's MMA fans would want to see it because, um, because it, either it, um, her versus Rosso or her versus Shevchenko is an absolute firefight for sure. No, no I, doubt, no, no doubt about it. And I actually think that he has an opportunity to beat both of them more so Alexa than Valentina. But I still think that they that they would both be super entertaining. Absolutely, I 100 percent agree with you. What do you uh, think? What, what do you think of my idea though of her co headlining the Spirit Show at UFC 306? It wouldn't be a bad idea. The only thing is, is Dana going to risk that? You know, risk losing the Grasso. Uh, I mean, the super fight with Grasso or Shevchenko. You never know, but then again, they don't even know if they're going to China or not. So they're yeah. gonna if they want to if they want to book her twice, they're gonna have to take a risk no matter what. So, fair enough. Uh, the so we mentioned Max Holloway. I mean, shout out to Dana, by the way. Oh, and uh, by the way, hey, by the way, hey, one last thing. Apparently, this was the most viewed fight, um, in China in the history of um. At sports, which is another thing I wanted to note. I think it was about thirty million people in China watch the watch the fight or something ridiculous like that. Which is it's insane, and we, you know that just goes to show Whaley's star power, at least in China, and the fact that it's increased. I would even say, within the sport itself, given that she was in one of the greatest fights of all time against Joanna. Oh, for sure. I would oh. even compare it to their version of like you know. Oh, the Premier League gets really popular in the UK. A way we it is their version of the Premier League. So of course millions of people are gonna are gonna are gonna see it over there. So absolutely which is which is which is awesome, which it really does kind of pain me a little bit that that this fight, the biggest fight in Chinese um in 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 in, in uh in Chinese women's MMA history, he was not in China because the because because the viewers it would have been would have been like would have been like nothing like people have ever, have ever seen before. So, for sure. Uh, shout out to Dana White, by the way. Three hundred thousand dollar bonuses, which uh, Max ended up getting fight of the night and performance of the night. So six hundred thousand dollars went to him. It just Insane sucks. Day. It just sucks that Pereira wasn't one of the people who got a bonus because I thought he was more than bonus worthy after that knockout. That's for that's for sure. But the other one did go to Hiri Prohaska, who had a solid knockout of his own. Yeah, uh, this is another um, ex uh, well, one near exact prediction that I got right. I said Prohaska would win by knockout in the second round. I think but we both had that perfect. Um, oh, hey, did I say the did I see the first round or the second round? I think we both said second round. Okay. And so we, if so, we we both we both did we both did nailed this properly. This was the Yuri Prohaska of old, and uh, man, if he fights uh, if he fights Jamal Hill next, Jamal oh better be better be ready because he already looked like he was back in championship form again. Um, yeah, you know, this, I, I think Zan, this opens the door for a potential rematch with Pereira. Oh, for sure. Which I think, and I was telling my dad this. And Saturday night, that if he already fights Jamal again, it's going to be a very different fight. That's what I. That's what that's I think what, so. That's what I think. I yeah. think so. I think it's going to be a fun fight. And honestly, the Yuri performance here tells me if if they go with Yuri versus Hill, uh, may not be a good night for Hill. 
No, I don't think so either. So if they go with that fight next, um, does it make all the sense in the world to put it to MSG? Because I think it does. What do you, what I do you think? I could see it. I could see it. I would love to see the samurai in MSG. Oh, for for the walkout, um, the walkout would be would be would would be something else, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Did you see the video of him before the card? Uh, the I night did. before the card, he was just standing there outside of the team oval. I did. So I have to ask you, what do you think of? Because there was a mixed reaction amongst the MMA media. What did you think of full violence and repost in that with the video zoomed in and stuff? Did you think? Did, did you think it was creepy or did you think it was interesting that the that it ended up making the waves that it did. Because there was a little bit there, there was a little bit of small that. controversy around I actually, that. I actually didn't see the video. So I, yeah, I saw so, the original. So pretty much what happened was some fan, I don't know, it was either a fan or a media member or someone took out their phone and saw that he was across the street and, zo- and zoomed in on him and all violent and picked up the video and posted it. And a bunch of people had a, had a mixed reactions to say that, you know, he was just outside the arena minding his own business. Why did you have to make it public? So there were some there were some people going back and forth about it. But I mean, him stoically looking at the T-Mobile arena at 16 hours before he was about to walk out. Well, he did show me that he was ready for battle. And once I saw that, I'm like, yeah, I think I feel pretty confident with my Dory Prolaska pick. And sure, and sure <laughs> I, enough, sure, I did sure, too. Sure enough, I was right. So. As as the kids say these days, he's locked in. He was locked in. That's for sure. And speaking of locked in, in my uh, in my survivor pool, in James Lynch's Discord, shout out to James Lynch, by the way, the best free he wins MMA journalist in the business. In his survivor pool, I did pick Yuri Prolaska. So I'm alive. I'm alive for another week. So I'm excited. I'm excited about that. So, uh, one other thing from UFC 300, Kayla Harrison. Getting her the win in her uh, UFC debut, Holly should surprise everybody by actually uh, grappling up with her, pulling a reversal on her. But it was also one of the stupidest things that she that she could have done. Yeah, unfortunately, and this one I I got exactly right too. Kayla first in second round submission. I was looking like a genius on Saturday with my ten and three record. Anyway, nonetheless, a really dominant performance, a vintage Kayla Harrison performance. Um, had Holly Holm kept it standing, I think the fight would have been interesting. But Kayla Harrison was there for one mission and one mission only. And that was to prove that she belonged in the UFC, that she could make 135 pounds, which she did. Even though she, even though she did, did make it at 136, it still well, did come for this fight, so good for her. And um, I think uh, I think Bantamweight all of a sudden has gotten very fun because now there's a new contender in the mix. And it's... And, like Amanda Nunes was very impressed, and it seemed like Dana was very intrigued that if Kay Larson potentially won the UFC Bantamweight title, and if Amanda Nunes came back, I think it would be one of the biggest Bantamweight fights ever. So I think there's a lot of possibilities with what you do with Kay Larson next, but on the side of Holly Holm, I think that's one of the last times we're, we're going to see her in the octagon because she just looked old, unfortunately. That was the that that, that was the Dana part. did say Dana did say at the press conference that he wants her to retire. He yeah, sure and, did. And, and you and you were and you're right, referencing the video that Nunes uh posted watching the post fight interview and then flipping out when she didn't get the call out. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. What what did you think though of Chris Cyborg on Twitter afterwards though? Uh, saying I mean, that I, she wants the winner. I mean, hey, it's smart uh it's a smart play. Chris Cyborg still thinks she's she she's the baddest woman in the world. She he's still waiting for the PFL to get for a date for the Laura Pacheco fight. Actually, really- actually, Dan, it's funny that you say that. I just saw on Chris Cyborg's Twitter, it says something about fight. It is on. Oh, really? It's red uh, ten hours ago from the time that we're recording this. A red alert. You know, the red alert tweet, it says it's happening. Chris Cyborg X L, L P, Larissa Pacheco is next PFL. So, but, but there's no date or anything, but Cyborg saying it's official. Okay. Hey, well, it seems like all of to do my due diligence this week. If Peter Murray or Don Davis is there, I better um, ask that question to clarify if what, if, what, if what she is tweeting is exactly correct. Uh, they saw Pat, her. Is, Pat is a theory <laughs> about that. They saw her call out Kayla and got fed up. <laughs> hey, 
that could be the, that could be pretty much a possibility considering that they use Twitter for a lot of different promotional tactics. So you never, you never know. So at this point, I, I mean, but Sam, like we said, at this point, we need the fight to happen. With Cyborg right. and, uh, uh, right. and it doesn't yeah. seem like, and, and it doesn't seem like Dana White wants to be in the Chris Cyborg business still. Oh no. That's why he quickly brushed off the question. It was like, no, <laughs> no, no way. All right. Speaking of the PFL, quickly, let's go to the Vegas card. Yeah, and but did I it called, again. I called this one. <laughs> I called this one first round knockout. <laughs> uh, he well, every light heavyweight fight ended in a knockout. This was so fun, insane. This has to be one of the best PFL cards in recent memory. And Tom, the pacing on this card was unbelievable. We were forty minutes into the card, and three fights had already happened. It was unreal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think we were out of there by like 11, 11.30. I know. Eastern time. It, it was weird, but I like it. Uh, oh, for sure. Impa. Impa's just, man, he is at another level at 2 really I've said really it before, is. I'll say it again. He really is. And the soon, and his, and, and his soon to be Harvard uh, master's student on top of that, too. Yeah, it's unbelievable everything that Impa is doing. Um, but like uh, producer Pat said before, my question is, is he eventually going to tire out? It's seven fights in like 13 months. Pro, uh, I mean, I guess with, with, with every fighter, that's the big question. It's going to be a matter of who his next fight is going to be. And if, if he, and if he can maintain the same consistency, but everybody's, um, everybody's win streak or run, if you will, has to come to an end at some point. I don't know if it's going to be now or in a couple of months, but it very well could be a possibility, but as long as Impa makes makes the postseason, anything anything can happen. So, at least we're at least we're still early in the regular season, and we're not talking about a possibility where 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 if he loses his season is over. Well, barring obviously other outcomes that could be the case, but it's still early in the sense that if he loses, he he can still bounce back and find his way up through the regular season to see what ends up happening. So absolutely. Uh Speaking of light heavyweights and first round finishes, Rob Wilkinson, quick finish of Tom Breeze. I think Wilkinson looks good uh, ever since, you know, with good in his comeback performance. Yeah, this was too easy. I thought that Tom Breeze was going to give him a hell of a fight, and I was sure wrong about that. I didn't think that Tom Breeze was going to win, but I I definitely thought it was going to be way more competitive. Rob Wilkinson just looked on a completely different level. It was very, very impressive to see, and he's that. Definitely a dark horse in the regular season. That, that if he keeps winning and he keeps climbing the standings, he could be a very heavy favorited seed by the time October, November goes around. Where things could get, things could get, could get very very interesting. Yeah, and I respect Impa, but I think the level of competition, especially with the Bellator influence now, he's got a tougher road ahead of him to repeat. Oh, for sure. Champion. Oh, for uh, sure. And very, I guess, I guess to give you credit, considering that you're a company guy, I guess now that they figured out the pacing problem, this uh, this um, this PFL season might end up getting very, 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 very fun very quickly, contrary to popular belief, which is something that that you or truly someone who is not been a fan of the season format would have would have not said about a about a year I think, ago. I think the Bellator fighters that have come in have made this thing a lot more interesting. I think so too, and that's why I think I'm a lot more positive about it than I was maybe eight to ten months ago. So good. Uh speaking of first round finishes with the light heavyweights, uh main card opened a uh, very, very weird finish. Josh Silvera, Sabadusi, excellent, you know, a lot of hype around this fight. Sabadusi, obviously the former welterweight champion, moving up 35 pounds to Insane. light heavyweight. Insane. And then um, breaks his thumb supposedly during the fight. So the, the fight goes to the ground. Sees holding his hand, alerts the referee, and the fight ends there awkwardly. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're going to see the real Sabadu see until he ends up fighting again with a 100% healthy hand. You know, obviously, congratulations to Silvera for getting his points, but, but I feel like you never want to win in that fashion, and thankfully, it's still early. So maybe these two could end up settling their differences in, in, in an elimination type fight in the postseason, but you never want to, you never want to win that way. That's for Absolutely. that's for sure. Although I will end on a more positive note, the lightweight action 
Clay Collard for Tricky Pitbull. What a fight. And Collard, like you said, kind of said off here, looked like a vintage Collard kind of performance. He re it really, it re really didn't. His hand speed just continues to look fantastic. I mean, we, we, we look at Pitbull in the list. And in the legendary name that the, those guys had, but Collard just threw all that out the window. Did, more than likely, he didn't even care who he was fighting and just wailed on him. I mean, it was a it was a dominant performance, and he's oh. definitely someone to keep an eye on during the rest of the regular season. Because if you stand with Clay Collard, it could end up being a short night, and that is exactly what happened with Patricky Pitbull. So it was very, very impressive. For sure. Uh, let's do a little previewing, Zan, before we get out of here. We got a big title fight in boxing this weekend over at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Super lightweight title on the line. The undefeated Devin Haney taking on Ryan Garcia. This fight is still happening. Yes. It's unbelievable. All You go first with your pick and analysis. What do you think? What do you think of this fight? Very simply, Zan. I mean, Ryan Garcia, one of my colleagues actually proposed something to me, which was very interesting about if Ryan Garcia was doing a little bit of this on purpose because, you know, to kind of throw Devin Haney off his game, which is a little weird to say. I don't know what you think about that. Oh, I don't um, I don't agree with that for a second. I think he has genuine mental health issues that need to get it addressed even beyond this fight. He's not the same Ryan Garcia that everybody yeah. knows. I mean, yeah, he, no, I don't. he's... He, I mean, I mean, he's gone as far to block random boxing content creators with less than a thousand followers. If you're doing that, then something is very, very wrong, in my, in my, in my opinion. And 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 that concerns me. That concerns me heading into this fight. I don't know. Look, I get it. You need to have a little insanity to, to do to partake in combat sports, right? I but get that you need is, to be. You need is, to look aggressive. But this is too far. This is too far, and this is just on a strange level that doesn't make sense. And he's saying all these conspiratorial things that nobody even remotely believes. And if you and if you do, I think you have your own sets of issues. But the, that's a discussion for another day. But still, it's just like it's one of those things where, you know, he's just not conducting himself as a professional. I'm not even sure if he's taking this fight seriously. Um, I have the I have the press schedule. To my left, in the press conference is scheduled for Thursday at and at, at two p. a local time, and that is going to be a very interesting press conference because what I'm watching for in that one is if he even remotely shows up. That's my that's my that's that's my question. And I understand that this fight is still on, but I'm not going to believe it until after the weigh-ins are over. What about what about you? I know because now that you said that, I'm like, oh, but if he doesn't show up, that's going to look really bad. Now. Uh, in terms of their resumes, I mean, Javier Fortuna, the, the only loss Ryan Garcia has is to Gervonta Davis. So, and, what and, was, and, what, and what was, and what was an absolute cl that's a classic fight that was very close until, until the, until the body shot landed. Would you not, would you not agree? Absolutely. And then adding in his finishes of Luke Campbell, Francisco uh, Fonseca, but you know, I think Ryan Garcia, as much as I'm concerned about his mental health is still, one of the great boxers of this game. Oh, for sure. I just think I just think Devin Haney is another level above. He I really, mean, listen, he listen really to this is. resume, Zan. Listen to this resume. Uh, Gamboa, Linares, Joe Diaz Jr., Cambosos twice, Vasily Loma, Regis Proges. That's a solid resume. He has fought some of the best, and he has beaten them. He hasn't gotten, he's not so much of a finisher, but Zan, given the fact of Ryan Garcia's condition, I think that could change in this fight. I think Devin Haney could finish Garcia here. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, if Haney finishes Garcia, his star power goes through the roof as being probably in the top three, the most popular boxers of his current generation, right up there with Canelo and Ernest Crawford. I mean, if he's not already there, a win over a win over a win over Garcia definitely puts him in, in that conversation. And I agree with you. I'm going to pick Devin Haney to finish him. I'm going to say Devin Haney round seven um, TKO. A very very close fight through round four and and round five is where Devin Haney is going to really start to put 
that are hurting Eden Garcia and then eventually finish him. It'll either end up being a TKO win in round seven or a doctor stoppage right before round eight. I think it is going to be a clear master class performance for Haney. And, it, and at this point, I think he can end up calling out whoever he wants because because right now, as I just alluded to, he's a top four star in boxing, if not, if not, if not top two. So, Absolutely. Um, my I'm prediction. Excited, I'm, exci- I'm excited. To, I'm excited to see it. What about what about you? I'm- my prediction is going to be very similar to yours. Okay. I'm actually you talked about a round seven knockout. Tank finished Garcia round seven with that knockout. So That's you're going right. with the same But yep. given Garcia's state of mind, I'm going to go one step earlier. I think it's going to be round six. Okay. Do you think it's going to be a round six in the close fight, or do you think it's going to be a round, round six in the Devin Haney I think, master class? What do you, I, think what do you think? I think the first round is going to be a little bit of a feeling out round, and okay. then from the second round on, it's going to be a master class by Haney. Okay. okay. That's that's my pick. And, but, and if you, would you would you argue that the this is the biggest club bet sports event of the week, of the weekend, given that there is no UFC on Saturday. I would say I, mean, I would I, say so. I mean, that's a given. And Zan, as far as you talk, what talking about with Devin Haney's future? Well, given who we just talked about, given resumes and stuff, I want to see Devin Haney if he wins this fight versus Tank Davis. Of course, everybody, everybody, everybody. <laughs> everybody, everybody I think, I know, but I think at that point, Zan, I think if he finishes Ryan Garcia. I think we're running out of time and options of this. I think it's going to become a must at that point. All right. Let's get versus Devin Haney for for July 27th at at um at and he stadium a week before Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson. What do you what do you think? Or you mean a week after? A week after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh I like the sound of it. Are they willing to compete? I mean, I, I, I honestly, actually, they wouldn't have to compete if the UFC's in Manchester. They would make the card earlier, wouldn't they? R- right. Yeah. That's what I. That's what I think. Yeah. Uh, go for it. Make July twenty seventh for make July twenty seventh a night of combat sports. It it gets sort of an unofficial tradition, considering that July twenty ninth was the biggest night in combat sports over the summer. Oh, yeah, then, I, then you'd have you're, you'd probably have Ryzen on that day. You'd probably yeah. have uh, another boxing match on that day. Make it happen. End of July, big weekend of sports. For sure. No doubt about it. But we're, we're both picking Devin Haney to win, and we're both picking De- Devin Haney to walk out of uh, to walk out of Barclays Center. It's one of boxing's biggest stars going into the second of a 2024. I like that. I like this. I do that myself for sure. Good. Uh, let's talk about PFL Chicago for a little bit, Sam. Since you'll be there, I want to get your thoughts on this. Here's a really interesting matchup. Andre Korshkov versus Magomed Umaladov. Korshkov was one of the better Bellator welterweights. Very rarely ever lost. Um, Umaladov could have been a PFL welterweight champion. He was a top name at welterweight last season. Unfortunately, he was unable to make the playoffs. So we didn't get to see the long-awaited Magomed versus Magomed fight that people desired. So, uh, uh, un- 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 Unfortunately. Um First off, this is an action-packed clash of styles. For those who have never who have never seen Uma uh, fight, you were in for, for a treat. I expect this to be an all-out war for, for 15 minutes, and I actually see Korshkov job, just given that he is a little bit more of an experience factor, edging out a very, very, very close, hotly debated split decision, and it will pretty much be Mahagamed um, Uma but off clear, clearly winning the first round, a courage of clearly winning the second, and then the third round being the round that's up for debate. I think it ends up being one of the best PFL fights of this early stage of the regular season. And one of those fights where people who are going to be physically in the wind West arena won't want to get up out of their seat after the fight, after the it's over, because it'll be, it'll be, it'll be that good. That's what I, that's what I think. Zan, I'm going to agree with you. Except I'm going to go the other way. I'm going to go with Umalada with the split decision. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think, I think Umalada's experience in the PFL and Korshkov getting a little up there at this point, even though he's very well experienced, I think Umalada is going to have a little more in the tank to get the win here. I think it's okay. going to be highly competitive for sure, though. Do you think Do you think it's going to be a decision that people are going to be pissed about, or do you think it's going to be a decision that most people will end up agreeing with? What do you I mean, with a split decision, Zan, I assume there's going to be some pissiness. Right. 
Is that even a word? Pissiness. No. <laughs> but because you just came up with it in your own in your in your own dictionary. We'll we'll we'll, we'll accept it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh co-main event, uh the return of Brendan Logdane. Out for blood after being upset by Jesus Pinedo, one of the greatest upsets of 2023. He's out to get his featherweight title back, and he's got to go through Pedro Cavallo first. Yeah, I, I don't see you know, Longing loses this fight. It actually have him finishing by TKO in the second round. I think it will be an actually pack slugfest from this. Again, the fight starts until it's over, but as you just alluded to, Longing is in a crazy revenge tour, and I do when he doesn't start off his PFL regular season on the wrong foot, uh, give me, give, give me, give, give me the win for him on Friday at, 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 at Windrush to start off his regular season the right way. 100% agree with you. I'm going second round finish as well for Lognane. There's just no way. He needs something like this. Oh, no doubt about it. All right. Programming note before we get out of here, the MMA Outsiders will not be on the air next week. We're actually going to take a little breather because, you know, that that we got a little break in the action from everything other than Chicago, PFL Chicago and the Haney Garcia stuff. Although, although well, we can schedule and time it out, right, depending on how the Haney Ryan Garcia fight goes, we, he might, he'd be back just briefly with instant reaction. But in terms of a full show, we will be off uh, next week, the week of April 27th. So. Absolutely. Uh, however. Join the two of us and producer Pat for a special look back live stream on playback April 23rd. Two day, one week from today. Two I'm weeks. Excited about, I'm excited about this. <coughs> Pardon me. Two days before the NFL draft happens. So we're entering an NFL draft with a very big quarterback class. So we're going to look back on some of the highs and lows of quarterbacks who were drafted. You know, who was drafted too high? Who was a hidden gem? Uh, we'll definitely talk about Jamarcus Russell being one of the biggest busts. I think the biggest bust in NFL history. Of course, he so, came out too early. What can we? What can we say? So we will. We will date. We will talk about all of that. All the highs and the lows of quarterbacks drafted. For, for sure, I'm excited for that. And so oh, much more. And stay tuned for all, all the different things we're doing on playback because the, because the next few months. Is, I mean that we play our cards right are going to be very, very fun. That's for that's for sure. For sure. All right. Time for us to get out of here. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you get notified of everything here at the Empty the Bench Network. Make sure that, that subscribe button here on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ETB network. We just passed 730 subscribers. We're continuing our climb. Make sure to listen to the MMA pod, the MMA Outsiders podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Acast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, so much more. If you are listening on the audio-only platforms, we thank you. Make sure, again, to check out our YouTube home. Go to ecbpodcast.com for more content. A lot of blog content coming out. And there's more blog content coming up as the NFL draft is slowly approaching. Um, to my right, as always, Zambando, writer for bjfen.com and MMA Knockout. Follow him at Zambando99 on Tom Alvano. Uh, contributor to MMA News, fan side of MMA, and the PFL website. Follow me at Thomas J. Albano. Make sure to follow us across social media at MMA Outsiders ETV, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Empty the Bench Podcast Network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at ETV Network. And special again, shout out to Playback, who have been great partners with us already. Make sure to tune in. If you are listening on the uh, first day of the, the premiere day of the show, Make sure to tune in tonight for the Western Conference play-in stream and make sure to tune in tomorrow, the 17th, for the Eastern Conference portion of the stream. For, for sure. For, so for all that and so much more, I'm Z and he's Tom. Um, we will be back in two weeks for episode 81 of the MMA Outsiders presented by Playback. We hope you enjoy um, or we, you go up from us. And until then, enjoy the fights and be Joe Piper. Be Joe Piper. Take care, everyone. Take care.